The bells of St. Paul's Anglican Church have been sounding through Charlottetown and over the surrounding countryside of Prince Edward Island since 1747. Here is the country of Anne of Green Gables. This rust-colored earth washed by Atlantic waters was the cradle of our nationhood. And in 1964, the island celebrates the centennial of the first Confederation meeting. Charlottetown is the largest city in Canada's smallest province. Named for Queen Charlotte, wife of King George III, it was settled primarily by immigrants from the British Isles. But long before the white man came, the Mi'kmaq Indians had given the island their own name, Abigweed, Cradle on the Waves. Coincidence, possibly, but in 1864, on the 1st of September, 26 men would sit down around a table. The result of their meeting would forever brand Charlottetown as the cradle of confederation. Today, a magnificent new building rises as a memorial to that historic day. Adjoining this memorial is the old provincial building in which the fathers of confederation met. On the first floor is the chamber containing the table around which they talked, the chairs on which they sat. Here, our nation was born. And so it was only fitting that the main float in the opening parade should depict the first meeting of our country's founding fathers, complete with table pounding and strong work. Heading the parade was the pipe band of the 1st Battalion Black Watch Regiment. This float pictures Summerside as the pearl of PEI. Naturally, the small fry were out in force, as were the ladies from the local curling clubs. And this was one of the best shots made on the opening day of curling. As usual, the various rinks drove to the forum in style. And of course, what is a parade without a clown and a pony? Unseasonably warm weather made for a fine attendance along the route and gave the visiting curlers ample cause to enjoy the hospitable welcome of the Islanders. This was the first time the Canadian Curling Championships had been played in Prince Edward Island. And these young fellows figure to be ready the next time the big event comes to their home province. With the rapid growth of curling in Canada, it seems like just about everybody's mommy is a curler these days. A special float carried the four-time Briar champions, the Richardsons of Regina, to the scene of the 1964 Canadian Curling Championships, the Charlottetown Forum. Premier Walter Shaw arrives and greets two young curlers of the future. The Briar would be the first major spectacle of PEI's Confederation Year celebration. The Black Watch Pipers lead Canada's top curlers down the ice. This is always one of the most colorful and exciting aspects of any briar for both contestants and spectators alike. Gordon Bennett, committee chairman, opened the proceedings on behalf of the island curlers. Briar trustee, the Honorable Thane A. Campbell, welcomes the teams to his native province. PEI's Lieutenant Governor, W.J. MacDonald, called on Manitoba's Lieutenant Governor, Eric Willis, to hold the broom for DCA President Dick Topping as he throws the first rock to open the Charlottetown Briar.
A little extra help brings it right into the button. And so in the friendly atmosphere so typical of the roaring game, the 1964 curling championships got underway. The Alberta rink loosens up as they try the ice before the opening game. The first draw brought together the four-time Briar champions from Saskatchewan, the Richardsons, and Bruce Hudson's rink from Manitoba. Ernie delivers his first rock. The elk turn slides in nicely, and Saskatchewan lie free. Seeing a boyhood dream come true as he performs in his first briar is Bruce Hudson of Winnipeg. He removes the guard but rolls wide, leaving Saskatchewan lying too. Third Arnold Richardson gives the ice to Cousin Ernie. It's an easy draw for the big fellow from Regina. He comes in to count three. Saskatchewan goes ahead 4-2. They never relinquish the lead and win their first game 11-5. Playing on the next sheet was Ron Northcott's rink from Calgary and Lyle Dagg's entry from Vancouver. In the 12th end, the score is tied 8-all as Dagg delivers. It has beautiful weight to draw in for shot. Alberta was leading 8-2 after seven ends, but was not able to score a point for the rest of the game. Northcott is narrow and raises his own guard to protect BC's shot rock. Dag has been knocking on the door for a long time and wants the championship on the west coast. He gets more protection here and looks pretty safe from up top. Ron Northcott wants to raise his own guard onto the BC shot rock but he's wide and goes through the house. BC count one. Final score, British Columbia nine, Alberta eight. Representing the province of Ontario for the second straight year was the fine young rink from Hanover, Ontario, skipped by Bob Mann. Here they're behind BC eight seven, as Mann's first rock comes in to cut the button and lies shot. This target presents no particular difficulty for Skip Dag. He removes the Ontario stone and rolls to lie three. The Ontario Skip has hopes of drawing in behind the British Columbia rocks. And his hopes come true as he draws in to lie shot. Lyle Dagg decides to use the same recipe. His rock is a little narrow and wicks off a guard, but the luck of the roll is with him and he counts one. BC wins the game 9-7. The host province of Prince Edward Island had high hopes for its great young curlers skipped by Art Burke. Here in the seventh, they're trailing Quebec, but are lying three. Burke's last rock slides in and PEI now lie four. Quebec skip Elmer Black has to make a tough shot through a port to prevent a big end counting against it. He does it to stay and count one. Quebec go ahead 5-3 after seven ends. It was a seesaw struggle all the way, and now in the 11th, Quebec leads 7-6, has last rock, and lies one as Art Burke delivers his first stone. He draws through a three-foot port to remove Quebec's shot rock and stay to lie one. Now Black delivers. He makes a beautiful shot, but rolls into the open to provide an easy target for PEI. Burke delivers an intern, hoping for a roll. 
He gets the rock, but not the roll, and lies vulnerable. The Quebec skip's last rock comes in with beautiful weight to push PEI stone to the back of the house. Quebec counts one to go ahead 8-6, and they win the game 8-7. Here, the B.C. rink meets New Brunswick. They're all tied up in the seventh, 4-4. B.C. is shot. Dag goes after the New Brunswick second stone. He gets it, but rolls out himself. British Columbia now lies two. New Brunswick skip Hal Maybe holds the broom for Sun Hap, who throws Skip's rocks. Young Hap wants to break this tie in favor of New Brunswick. He makes a beautiful double takeout and stays to lie one. But he leaves a lovely target. The 34-year-old public relations man from Vancouver takes full advantage of it. It's an easy out for Dag as he counts two. BC goes ahead 6-4 and win the game 10-6. In the 35-year history of the Briar, many magnificent shots have been made, but none better than in the sequence you're about to see. Ontario trails Saskatchewan 8-7 here in the 11th end. Saskatchewan is shot behind a good guard. But there is a narrow port, and Bob Mann comes through it with inches to spare and nudges Saskatchewan back to lie one. Big Ernie is faced with the inevitable. He, too, must go through the port. Wes and Sam lean on the brooms. It's through to move Ontario back, and Saskatchewan now lie free. Mann, one of the grittiest competitors to ever throw a stone in the Canadian Curling Championships, says he can do it again. He delivers with infinite care. And the seemingly impossible happens. He does do it again, to draw in and lie one. This is a perfect example of why the knowledgeable ones say the finest curling in the world is seen at the briar. Ernie's delivery is silken smooth. The front end sweeps. The payoff rock slides through the port, rolls the Ontario stone out of the way, and Saskatchewan count four. They go ahead 12-7 and win the game 12-8. While Richardson and Mann were thrilling the crowd at center ice, two maritime rinks were setting a new low-scoring record. Tied three all in the 12th, Nova Scotia's skip Ian Baird removes New Brunswick's shot rock. Hap maybe goes for the cold draw to the empty house. Now the pressure is on Ian Baird. Will he draw or hit? The genial gentleman from the Glue Scaff Curling Club says he'll draw. Watched carefully by Mo Kenny and Dunk Smith, it slides in to lay up against New Brunswick's shot rock. Nova Scotia count one and win the lowest scoring game ever played in the Canadian Curling Championship. Final score, 4-3. A total of six ends were blanked. By Thursday, the big question that had still to be answered was, could the Richardsons do it again? That afternoon, with six straight wins behind them, they met Jack Polyblank's Northern Ontario rink from Kirkland Lake. Here in the sixth end, the score is tied three all, and now Northern Ontario lie two. If Polyblank can make this easy draw to the house, he'll count a big three-ender against the defending champion. It's no trick at all. Northern Ontario go ahead 6-3 after six ends. With Skip's last rocks to come in the seventh, Northern Ontario lies two. Polly Blank delivers. It's in there to lie three, but leaves plenty of room for the Regina Skip to draw.
This time, the entire Richardson clan get into the act. Heavy sweeping is in order, and the Saskatchewan Rock edges in to count one. At the end of seven, it's Northern Ontario six, Saskatchewan four. Northern Ontario picked up one in the eighth, they blanked the ninth, and here in the tenth, Northern Ontario is shot. Polly Blank decides to spread the wealth around. His outturn comes in nicely, leaving him lying too. With only two ends to go and trailing 7-4, the four-time champion needs points. He gets two more, but time ran out on the Richardsons. Northern Ontario pulled the first big upset of the 1964 Briar. Jack Polyblank and his Kirkland Lake rink defeat the defending champions from Saskatchewan 8-6. In this game, Alberta is leading Newfoundland 2-1 in the six. Lying shot, Dave Pedley, the Newfoundland skip, is setting up a guard. And he gets a beauty. Alberta wants both of those rocks out of the house. Northcott has plenty of weight on his intern delivery, but he's wide moves the stones around, leaving Newfoundland lying too. The island province wins this end, but Alberta takes the game 7-4. And while this game was being played on Thursday evening, the second upset of the Charlottetown Briar was taking place. Elmer Black, strong young team from Quebec, was meeting British Columbia, the only undefeated rink in the round robin competition. Thursday was to be the day the favorites would go down to defeat. Quebec would emerge the winner after 12 ends of play by a score of 10-7 over British Columbia. So on Friday morning, a sellout crowd was on hand when the draw brought British Columbia and Saskatchewan together. Here in the seventh end, BC leads 3-1 as Dag goes after Saskatchewan's shot rock. He gets it and stays to lie two. Both rings had been having their fair share of misses up to this point. Tension was beginning to show. Ernie's first rock hits the front stone, shoving it over for the double takeout, but he rolls out himself, leaving an empty house. The West Coast skip wants to draw behind a short guard. Dag makes no mistake here. It's a good clutch shot. You can't get the ice much narrower than that. The big fellow from Regina can't afford to get any further behind. But he wrecks on the guard, leaving BC to count one. British Columbia hands Saskatchewan their second defeat of the Charlottetown Briar, 8-3. Now the only obstacle standing between British Columbia and the championship is the PEI rink. It was to prove a formidable barrier. All the pressure was smack on the BC entry. And while Saskatchewan was edging Nova Scotia on the next sheet, Dag started dropping behind Berkey and his sharpshooting teammates. Here in the sixth end, he removes one PEI rock, but the Islanders pick up two. Prince Edward Island goes ahead 4-2 after six. With Skip's last rocks in the seventh, the host rink lies two. Burke wants protection. His final rock comes into the edge of the house to set up a good guard. Dag is left no choice. He must draw to the button. It's watched closely, but he's inches heavy. PEI steals one to go ahead 5-2 after seven. Now in the eighth, Dag is shot with PEI lying second stone. Leading 5-2, Burke goes after shot rock. He knows BC can explode with a big end any time. He's dead on target. Now the Islanders lie two, 
but invite a double taker. However, Dag decides on a hit and roll. He removes one PEI rock and gets a perfect roll for a shot with backing. Now Art Burke calls for narrow ice. Many wonder why he doesn't draw to the shot. He hits the BC rock, removes his own second stone and rolls to lie one but wide open. If Dag can get him out of there and stay, he's going to pick up three big points. He makes it, and now it's a brand new ball game. BC counts three to tie it all up, 5-5. Five, five. BC picked up one in the ninth, and here in the tenth, Prince Edward Island is lying one. Dag wants to chip the Islander's shot rock, but gets a little too much of it. PEI still lie one. Burke figures the best guard is a second stone in the house, and he delivers an intern. The front end, sweep it into the edge of the eight foot. Now Dag gets the broom for the takeout. He makes it and rolls for shot. From here it looks like a measure for second stone. Burke figures he's got it and goes for the shot rock, expecting to count two. He gets it, but when the officials measure for second stone, BC gets the knock. So Prince Edward Island picks up just one point. Now it's a tie game again, six all. With Skip's rocks to come in the 11th, BC is shot. Art Burke wants a hit and roll. Right now he'd settle for anything but the miss he gets. He's through the house and BC still lies one. Leo Hebert, BC's third, gives ice for an out turn. Dag delivers with great care. It comes in to get partial protection behind PEI stone. Burke wants the shot out of the house and a possible roll onto the second BC rock. He delivers. He gets the shot rock, but rolls to the edge of the house. The Islanders now lie one. Dag decides on a cold draw. The front end watches carefully, but he's ounces heavy and slides too far. PEI count one. And so after 11 ends, Prince Edward Island seven, British Columbia, six. In the 12th end, BC is lying three as Burke gets the ice for his first rock. He wants to get into that nest of BC stones for backing. He nudges the British Columbia shot rock back and lies up against the second BC stone for shot. Having last rock, Dag figures that if he can chip the PEI stone out and stay, he'll be reasonably safe. He gets the island stone and one of his own, but stays to still lie three. So Burke must do it all over again. But he slides inches too far. British Columbia lie one. Dag has the tying rock counting, but needs one more to win the title. He's after PEI's second stone. He's a little what? Pushes his own shot rock back, but stays to count one and tie the game, 7-7. Seven, seven. And so we go into an extra end. With last rock against him, Dag had to set up a guard and hope to draw behind it. He achieved the first part of his plan and now delivers his first rock. This stone is right out of the book. It misses the guard by a fraction of an inch and slides to safety on the eight foot. 
Burke calls for wide ice to duplicate the shot. He delivers. He's a shade heavy. Gets a piece of the BC stone, but rolls out, leaving British Columbia still lying one. Dag wants another rock in the front of the house for protection. But he too is heavy, wicking off his own shot rock to roll partially into the open. BC lies too. Pressure on players and tension in the crowd mounts steadily. This is the payoff rock. Burke can see a good piece of the BC stone. He delivers and he watches. And he sees before anyone else in the forum that he's too wide. His stone slides through the house. BC counts two to win the game, 9-7. And so for the first time since 1948, British Columbia wins the McDonald Briar Tank. Mayor Goody congratulates all the teams for a great week of curling. David M. Stewart of McDonald Tobacco Incorporated thanks the host province for its hospitality. Then presented the new Canadian curling champions from the West Coast with the tank. Congratulations go to Skip Lyle Dagg, who accepts for British Columbia. Third, Leo Heber. Second, Fred Britton. And lead, Barry Nymar. Newly elected DCA president, Art Skinner, makes a second place award to the Richardsons of Regina. For curlers and spectators alike, it was an exciting and colorful start to Prince Edward Island's Confederation celebrations, a week that saw a new championship rink crowned at the Charlottetown Bright.